英語聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストと MP3 音声ダウンロードはホームページからご利用いただけます。88thpp.com、88thpp.com Chapter 15 In which is related the unfortunate adventure that Don Quixote fell in with when he fell out with certain heartless Yangsons. The sage Sid Amete Benengeli relates that as soon as Don Quixote took leave of his hosts and all who had been present at the burial of Chrysostom, he and his squire passed into the same wood which they had seen the shepherdess Marcella enter, and after having wandered for more than two hours in all directions in search of her without finding her, they came to a halt in a glade covered with tender grass, beside which ran a pleasant cool stream that invited and compelled them to pass there the hours of the noontide heat, which by this time was beginning to come on oppressively. Don Quixote and Sancho dismounted, And turning Rocinante and the ass loose to feed on the grass that was there in abundance, they ransacked the alforges, and without any ceremony, very peacefully and sociably, master and man made their repast on what they found in them. Sancho had not thought it worth while to hobble Rocinante, feeling sure, from what he knew of his staidness and freedom from incontinence, that all the mares in the Cordova pastures would not lead him into an impropriety. Chance, however, and the devil, who is not always asleep, So ordained it that feeding in this valley there was a drove of Galician ponies belonging to certain Yangason carriers, whose way it is to take their midday rest with their teams in places and spots where grass and water abound, and at where Don Quixote chanced to be suited the Yangson's purpose very well. It so happened, then, that Rocinante took a fancy to disport himself with their ladyships the ponies, and abandoning his usual gait and demeanour as he scented them, he, without asking leave of his master, got up a briskish little trot and hastened to make known his wishes to them. They, however, it seemed, preferred their pasture to him, and received him with their heels and teeth to such effect that they soon broke his girths and left him naked, without a saddle to cover him. But what must have been worse to him was that the carriers, seeing the violence he was offering to their mares, came running up armed with stakes, and so belabored him that they brought him sorely battered to the ground. By this time, Don Quixote and Sancho, who had witnessed the drubbing of Rocinante, came up panting, and said Don Quixote to Sancho. So far as I can see, Friend Sancho, these are not knights but base folk of low birth, I mention it because thou canst lawfully aid me in taking due vengeance for the insult offered to Rocinante before our eyes. What the devil vengeance can we take, answered Sancho, if they are more than twenty, and we know more than two, or, indeed, perhaps not more than one and a half? I count for a hundred, replied Don Quixote, and without more words he drew his sword and attacked the Yangsons and excited and impelled by the example of his master, Sancho did the same. And to begin with, Don Quixote delivered a slash at one of them that laid open the leather jerkin he wore, together with a great portion of his shoulder. The Yangsons, seeing themselves assaulted by only two men while there were so many, betook themselves to their stakes, and driving the two into the middle, they began to lay on with great zeal and energy. In fact, at the second blow, they brought Sancho to the ground, and Don Quixote fared the same way, all his skill and high metal availing him nothing, and fate willed it that he should fall at the feet of Rocinante, who had not yet risen. Whereby it may be seen how furiously stakes can pound in angry boorish hands. Then, seeing the mischief they had done, the Yangsons with all the haste they could loaded their team and pursued their journey, leaving the two adventurers a sorry sight and in sorrier mood. Sancho was the first to come to, and finding himself close to his master, he called to him in a weak and doleful voice, Senor Don Quixote, ah, Senor Don Quixote. What wouldst thou, brother Sancho? answered Don Quixote in the same feeble suffering tone as Sancho. I would like, if it were possible, answered Sancho Panza, your worship to give me a couple of sups of that potion of the fiery blast, if it be that you have any to hand there, perhaps it will serve for broken bones as well as for wounds. If I only had it here, wretch that I am, what more should we want? said Don Quixote, but I swear to thee, Sancho Panza, on the faith of a knight errant, ere two days are over, unless fortune orders otherwise, I mean to have it in my possession, or my hand will have lost its cunning. But in how many does your worship think we shall have the use of our feet? answered Sancho Panza. For myself, I must say I cannot guess how many, said the battered knight Don Quixote, but I take all the blame upon myself, for I had no business to put hand to sword against men who were not dubbed knights like myself, and so I believe that in punishment for having transgressed the laws of chivalry, the god of battles has permitted this chastisement to be administered to me, for which reason, brother Sancho, it is well thou shouldst receive a hint on the matter which I am now about to mention to thee. For it is of much importance to the welfare of both of us. It is it when thou shalt see rabble of this sort offering us insult thou art not to wait till I draw sword against them, for I shall not do so at all, but do thou draw sword and chastise them to thy heart's content, 
and if any knights come to their aid and defence I will take care to defend thee and assail them with all my might, and thou hast already seen by a thousand signs and proofs what the might of this strong arm of mine is equal to so uplifted had the poor gentleman become through the victory over the stout Biscayne. But Sancho did not so fully approve of his master's admonition as to let it pass without saying in reply, Senor, I am a man of peace, meek and quiet, and I can put up with any affront because I have a wife and children to support and bring up, so let it be likewise a hint to your worship, as it cannot be a mandate, that on no account will I draw sword either against clown or against knight, and that here before God I forgive the insults that have been offered me, whether they have been or, or shall be offered me by high or low, rich or poor, noble or commoner, not accepting any rank or condition whatsoever. To all which his master said in reply, I wish I had breath enough to speak somewhat easily, and that the pain I feel on this side would abate so as to let me explain to thee, Ponsa, the mistake thou makest. Come now, sinner, suppose the wind of fortune, hitherto so adverse, should turn in our favour, filling the sails of our desires so that safely and without impediment we put into port in some one of those islands I have promised thee, how would it be with thee if on winning it I may be lord of it? Why, thou wilt make it well nigh impossible through not being a knight nor having any desire to be one, nor possessing the courage nor the will to avenge insults or defend thy lordship, for thou must know that in newly conquered kingdoms and provinces the minds of the inhabitants are never so quiet nor so well disposed to the new lord that there is no fear of their making some move to change matters once more, and try, as they say, what chance may do for them. So it is essential that the new possessor should have good sense to enable him to govern, and valour to attack and defend himself, whatever may befall him. In what has now befallen us, answered Sancho, I'd have been well pleased to have that good sense and that valour your worship speaks of, but I swear on the faith of a poor man I am more fit for plasters than for arguments. See if your worship can get up, and let us help Rocinante, though he does not deserve it, for he was the main cause of all this thrashing. I never thought it of Rocinante, for I took him to be a virtuous person and as quiet as myself. After all, they say right that it takes a long time to come to know people, and that there is nothing sure in this life. Who would have said that, after such mighty slashes as your worship gave that unlucky knight errant, there was coming, travelling post and at the very heels of them, such a great storm of sticks as has fallen upon our shoulders? And yet thine, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, ought to be used to such squalls, but mine, reared in soft cloth and fine linen, it is plain they must feel more keenly the pain of this mishap, and if it were not that I imagine, why do I say imagine? Know of a certainty that all these annoyances are very necessary accompaniments of the calling of arms, I would lay me down here to die of pure vexation. To this the squire replied, Senor, as these mishaps are what one reaps of chivalry, tell me if they happen very often, or if they have their own fixed times for coming to pass, because it seems to me that after two harvests we shall be no good for the third, unless God in his infinite mercy helps us. No, friend Sancho, answered Don Quixote, that the life of knights errant is subject to a thousand dangers and reverses, and neither more nor less is it within an immediate possibility for knights errant to become kings and emperors, as experience has shown in the case of many different knights with whose histories I am thoroughly acquainted, and I could tell thee now, if the pain would let me, of some who simply by might of arm have risen to the high stations I have mentioned, and those same, both before and after, experience divers misfortunes and miseries, for the valiant Amadis of Gaul found himself in the power of his mortal enemy Archelaus the magician, who, it is positively asserted, holding him captive, gave him more than two hundred lashes with the reins of his horse while tied to one of the pillars of a court, and moreover there is a certain recondite author of no small authority who says that the knight of Phoebus, being caught in a certain pitfall, which opened under his feet in a certain castle, on falling found himself bound hand and foot in a deep pit underground, where they administered to him one of those things they call clisters, of sand and snow water, that well nigh finished him, and if he had not been succoured in that sore extremity by a sage, a great friend of his, it would have gone very hard with the poor knight, so I may well suffer in company with such worthy folk, for greater were the indignities which they had to suffer than those which we suffer. For I would have thee know, Sancho, that wounds caused by any instruments which happen by chance to be in hand inflict no indignity, and this is laid down in the law of the duel in express words, if, for instance, the cobbler strikes another with the last which he has in his hand, though it be in fact a piece of wood, it cannot be said for that reason that he whom he struck with it has been cudgelled. I say this lest thou shouldst imagine that because we have been drubbed in this affray we have therefore suffered any indignity, for the arms those men carried, with which they pounded us, were nothing more than their stakes, and not one of them, so far as I remember, carried rapier, sword, or dagger. They gave me no time to see that much, answered Sancho, for hardly had I laid hand on my disona when they signed the cross on my shoulders with their sticks in such style that they took the sight out of my eyes and the strength out of my feet, 
stretching me where I now lie, and where thinking of whether all those stake strokes were an indignity or not gives me no uneasiness, which the pain of the blows does, for they will remain as deeply impressed on my memory as on my shoulders. For all that let me tell thee, brother Ponsa, said Don Quixote, that there is no recollection which time does not put an end to, and no pain which death does not remove. And what greater misfortune can there be, replied Ponsa, than the one that waits for time to put an end to it and death to remove it. If our mishap were one of those that are cured with a couple of plasters, it would not be so bad, but I am beginning to think that all the plasters in a hospital almost won't be enough to put us right. No more of that, pluck strength out of weakness, Sancho, as I mean to do, returned Don Quixote, and let us see how Rocinante is, for it seems to me that not the least share of this mishap has fallen to the lot of the poor beast. There is nothing wonderful in that, replied Sancho, since he is a knight errant too, what I wonder it is that my beast should have come off scot-free where we come out scotched. Fortune always leaves a door open in adversity in order to bring relief to it, said Don Quixote, I say so because this little beast may now supply the one of Rocinante, carrying me hence to some castle where I may be cured of my wounds. And moreover I shall not hold it any dishonour to be so mounted, for I remember having read how the good old Silenus, the tutor and instructor of the gay god of laughter, when he entered the city of the hundred gates, went very contentedly mounted on a handsome ass. It may be true that he went mounted as your worship says, answered Sancho, but there is a great difference between going mounted and going slung like a sack of manure. To which Don Quixote replied, wounds received in battle confer honour instead of taking it away, and so, friend Ponsa, say no more, but, as I told thee before, get up as well as thou canst and put me on top of thy beast in whatever fashion pleases thee best, and let us go hence ere night come on and surprise us in these wilds. And yet I have heard your worship say, observed Ponsa, that it is very meet for knights errant to sleep in wastes and deserts, and that they esteem it very good fortune. That is, said Don Quixote, when they cannot help it, or when they are in love, and so true is this that there have been knights who have remained two years on rocks, in sunshine and shade and all the inclemencies of heaven, without their ladies knowing anything of it, and one of these was Amadis, when, under the name of Beltanebros, he took up his abode on the Pena Pobre for, I know not if it was eight years or eight months, for I am not very sure of the reckoning. At any rate he stayed there doing penance for I know not what Pete the Princess Oriana had against him, but no more of this now, Sancho, and make haste before a mishap like Rocinante's befalls the ass. The very devil would be in it in that case, said Sancho, and letting off thirty o's, and sixty sighs, and a hundred and twenty maledictions and execrations on whomsoever it was that had brought him there, he raised himself, stopping halfway bent like a Turkish bow without power to bring himself upright, but with all his pains he saddled his ass, who too had gone astray somewhat, yielding to the excessive license of the day, he next raised up Rocinante, and as for him, had he possessed a tongue to complain with, most assuredly neither Sancho nor his master would have been behind him. To be brief, Sancho fixed Don Quixote on the ass and secured Rocinante with a leading rein, and taking the ass by the halter, he proceeded more or less in the direction in which it seemed to him the high road might be, and, as chance was conducting their affairs for them from good to better, he had not gone a short league when the road came in sight, and on it he perceived an inn, which to his annoyance and to the delight of Don Quixote must needs be a castle. Sancho insisted that it was an inn, and his master that it was not one, but a castle, and the dispute lasted so long that before the point was settled they had time to reach it, and into it Sancho entered with all his team without any further controversy. Chapter 16 Of what happened to the ingenious gentleman in the INN which he took to be a castle. The innkeeper, seeing Don Quixote slung across the ass, asked Sancho what was amiss with him. Sancho answered that it was nothing, only that he had fallen down from a rock and had his ribs a little bruised. The innkeeper had a wife whose disposition was not such as those of her calling commonly have, for she was by nature kind-hearted and felt for the sufferings of her neighbours, so she at once set about tending Don Quixote, and made her young daughter, a very comely girl, help her in taking care of her guest. There was besides in the inn, as servant, an Asturian lass with a broad face, flat pole, and snub nose, blind of one eye and not very sound in the other. The elegance of her shape, to be sure, made up for all her defects, she did not measure seven palms from head to foot, and her shoulders, which overweighted her somewhat, made her contemplate the ground more than she liked. This graceful lass, then, helped the young girl, and the two made up a very bad bed for Don Quixote in a garret that showed evident signs of having formerly served for many years as a straw loft, in which there was also quartered a carrier whose bed was placed a little beyond our Don Quixote's, and, though only made of the pack saddles and cloths of his mules, had much the advantage of it, as Don Quixote's consisted simply of four rough boards on two not very even trestles, a mattress, 
that for thinness might have passed for a quilt, full of pellets which, were they not seen through the rents to be wool, would to the touch have seemed pebbles in hardness, two sheets made of buckler leather, and a coverlet the threads of which any one that chose might have counted without missing one in the reckoning. On this accursed bed Don Quixote stretched himself, and the hostess and her daughter soon covered him with plasters from top to toe, while Mari Tornas, for that was the name of the Asturian, held the light for them, and while plastering him, the hostess, observing how full of wheels Don Quixote was in some places, remarked that this had more the look of blows than of a fall. It was not blows, Sancho said, but that the rock had many points and projections, and that each of them had left its mark. Pray, senora, he added, manage to save some toe, as there will be no one of some one to use it, for my loins too are rather sore. Then you must have fallen too, said the hostess. I did not fall, said Sancho Panza, but from the shock I got at seeing my master fall, my body aches so that I feel as if I had had a thousand thwacks. That may well be, said the young girl, for it has many a time happened to me to dream that I was falling down from a tower and never coming to the ground, and when I awoke from the dream to find myself as weak and shaken as if I had really fallen. There is the point, senora, replied Sancho Panza, that I without dreaming at all, but being more awake than I am now, find myself with scarcely less wheels than my master, Don Quixote. How is the gentleman called? asked Mari Tornas the Asturian. Don Quixote of La Mancha, answered Sancho Panza, and he is a knight adventurer, and one of the best and stoutest that have been seen in the world this long time past. What is a knight adventurer? said the lass. Are you so new in the world as not to know? answered Sancho Panza. Well, then, you must know, sister, that a knight adventurer is a thing that in two words is seen drubbed an emperor, that is today the most miserable and needy being in the world, and tomorrow will have two or three crowns of kingdoms to give his squire. Then how is it, said the hostess, that belonging to so good a master as this, you have not, to judge by appearances, even so much as a county? It is too soon yet, answered Sancho, for we have only been a month going in quest of adventures, and so far we have met with nothing that can be called one, for it will happen that when one thing is looked for another thing is found. However, if my master Don Quixote gets well of this wound, or fall, and I am left none the worse of it, I would not change my hopes for the best title in Spain. To all this conversation Don Quixote was listening very attentively, and sitting up in bed as well as he could, and taking the hostess by the hand he said to her, Believe me, fair lady, you may call yourself fortunate in having in this castle of yours sheltered my person, which is such that if I do not myself praise it, it is because of what is commonly said, that self-praise debaseth, but my squire will inform you who I am. I only tell you that I shall preserve for ever inscribed on my memory the service you have rendered me in order to tender you my gratitude while life shall last me and would to heaven love held me not so enthralled and subject to its laws and to the eyes of that fair ingrate whom I name between my teeth, but that those of this lovely damsel might be the masters of my liberty. The hostess, her daughter, and the worthy Mari Tornas listened in bewilderment to the words of the knight errant, for they understood about as much of them as if he had been talking Greek, though they could perceive they were all meant for expressions of goodwill and blandishments, and not being accustomed to this kind of language, they stared at him and wondered to themselves, for he seemed to them a man of a different sort from those they were used to, and thanking him in pothouse phrase for his civility they left him, while the Asturian gave her attention to Sancho, who needed it no less than his master. The carrier had made an arrangement with her for recreation that night, and she had given him her word that when the guests were quiet and the family asleep she would come in search of him and meet his wishes unreservedly. And it is said of this good lass that she never made promises of the kind without fulfilling them, even though she made them in a forest and without any witness present, for she plumed herself greatly on being a lady and held it no disgrace to be in such an employment as servant in an inn, because, she said, misfortunes and ill luck had brought her to that position. The hard, narrow, wretched, rickety bed of Don Quixote stood first in the middle of this starlit stable, and close beside it Sancho made his, which merely consisted of a rush mat and a blanket that looked as if it was of threadbare canvas rather than of wool. Next to these two beds was that of the carrier, made up, as has been said, of the pack saddles and all the trappings of the two best mules he had, though there were twelve of them, sleek, plump, and in prime condition, for he was one of the rich carriers of Aravallo, according to the author of this history, who particularly mentions this carrier because he knew him very well, and they even say was in some degree a relation of his, besides which Sidamete Benengeli was a historian of great research and accuracy in all things, as is very evident since he would not pass over in silence those that have been already mentioned, however trifling and insignificant they might be, an example that might be followed by those grave historians who relate transactions so curtly and briefly that we hardly get a taste of them, all the substance of the work being left in the inkstand from carelessness,
perverseness, or ignorance. A thousand blessings on the author of Tablante de Ricomandi and that of the other book in which the deeds of the Conde Tamillas are recounted, with what minuteness they describe everything. To proceed, then, after having paid a visit to his team and given them their second feed, the carrier stretched himself on his pack saddles and lay waiting for his conscientious Maritornis. Sancho was by this time plastered and had lain down, and though he strove to sleep the pain of his ribs would not let him, while Don Quixote with the pain of his head his eyes as wide open as a hare's. The inn was all in silence, and in the whole of it there was no light except that given by a lantern that hung burning in the middle of the gateway. This strange stillness, and the thoughts, always present to our knight's mind, of the incidents described at every turn in the books that were the cause of his misfortune, conjured up to his imagination as extraordinary a delusion as can well be conceived, which was that he fancied himself to have reached a famous castle, for, as has been said, all the inns he lodged in were castles to his eyes, and that the daughter of the innkeeper was daughter of the lord of the castle, and that she, won by his hybrid bearing, had fallen in love with him, and had promised to come to his bed for a while that night without the knowledge of her parents, and holding all this fantasy that he had constructed as solid fact, he began to feel uneasy and to consider the perilous risk which his virtue was about to encounter, and he resolved in his heart to commit no treason to his lady Dulcinea del Toboso, even though the Queen Guinevere herself and the Dame Quintanona should present themselves before him. While he was taken up with these vagaries, then, at time and the hour, an unlucky one for him, arrived for the Asturian to come, who in her smock, with bare feet and her hair gathered into a fustian quaff, with noiseless and cautious steps entered the chamber where the three were quartered, in quest of the carrier, but scarcely had she gained the door when Don Quixote perceived her, and sitting up in his bed in spite of his plasters and the pain of his ribs, he stretched out his arms to receive his beauteous damsel. The Asturian, who went all doubled up and in silence with her hands before her feeling for her lover, encountered the arms of Don Quixote, who grasped her tightly by the wrist, and drawing her towards him, while she dared not utter a word, made her sit down on the bed. He then felt her smock, and although it was of sackcloth it appeared to him to be of the finest and softest silk, on her wrist she wore some glass beads, but to him they had the sheen of precious orient pearls, her hair, which in some measure resembled a horse's mane, he rated as threads of the brightest gold of Araby, whose refulgence dimmed the sun himself, her breath, which no doubt smelt of yesterday's stale salad, seemed to him to diffuse a sweet aromatic fragrance from her mouth, and, in short, he drew her portrait in his imagination with the same features and in the same style as that which he had seen in his books of the other princesses who, smitten by love, came with all the adornments that are here set down, to see the sorely wounded knight, and so great was the poor gentleman's blindness that neither touch, nor smell, nor anything else about the good lass that would have made any but a carrier vomit, were enough to undeceive him, on the contrary. He was persuaded he had the goddess of beauty in his arms, and holding her firmly in his grasp he went on to say in low, tender voice. Would that found myself, lovely and exalted lady, in a position to repay such a favour as that which you, by the sight of your great beauty, have granted me, but fortune, which is never weary of persecuting the good, has chosen to place me upon this bed, where I lie so bruised and broken that though my inclination would gladly comply with yours it is impossible, besides, to this impossibility another yet greater is to be added which is the faith that I have pledged to the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso, sole lady of my most secret thoughts, and were it not that this stood in the way I should not be so insensible a night as to miss the happy opportunity which your great goodness has offered me. Mari Tornas was fretting and sweating at finding herself held so fast by Don Quixote, and not understanding or heeding the words he addressed to her, she strove without speaking to free herself. The worthy carrier, whose unholy thoughts kept him awake, was aware of his doxy the moment she entered the door, and was listening attentively to all Don Quixote said, and jealous that the Asturian should have broken her word with him for another, drew nearer to Don Quixote's bed and stood still to see what would come of this talk which he could not understand, but when he perceived the wench struggling to get free and Don Quixote striving to hold her, not relishing the joke he raised his arm and delivered such a terrible cuff on the lank jaws of the amorous knight that he bathed all his mouth in blood, and not content with this he mounted on his ribs and with his feet tramped all over them at a pace rather smarter than a trot. The bed which was somewhat crazy and not very firm on its feet, unable to support the additional weight of the carrier, came to the ground, and at the mighty crash of this the innkeeper awoke and at once concluded that it must be some brawl of Maritornas, because after calling loudly to her he got no answer. With this suspicion he got up, and lighting a lamp hastened to the quarter where he had heard the disturbance. The wench, seeing that her master was coming and knowing that his temper was terrible, frightened and panic-stricken made for the bed of Sancho Panza, who still slept and crouching upon it made a ball of herself. The innkeeper came in exclaiming, Where art thou, strumpet? Of course this is some of thy work. 
At this Sancho awoke, and feeling this mass almost on top of him fancied he had the nightmare and began to distribute fisticuffs all round, of which a certain share fell upon Mari Tornas, who, irritated by the pain and flinging modesty aside, paid back so many in return to Sancho that she woke him up in spite of himself. He then, finding himself so handled, by whom he knew not, raising himself up as well as he could, grappled with Mari Tornas, and he and she between them began the bitterest and drollest scrimmage in the world. The carrier, however, perceiving by the light of the innkeeper candle how it fared with his lady love, quitting Don Quixote, ran to bring her the help she needed, and the innkeeper did the same but with a different intention, for his was to chastise the lass, as he believed that beyond a doubt she alone was the cause of all the harmony. And so, as the saying is, cat to rat, rat to rope, rope to stick, the carrier pounded Sancho, Sancho the lass, she him, and the innkeeper her, and all worked away so briskly that they did not give themselves a moment's rest, and the best of it was that the innkeeper's lamp went out, and as they were left in the dark they all laid on one upon the other in a mass so unmercifully that there was not a sound spot left where a hand could light. It so happened that there was lodging that night in the inn a codriaro of what they call the old holy brotherhood of Toledo, who, also hearing the extraordinary noise of the conflict, seized his staff and the tin case with his warrants, and made his way in the dark into the room crying, Hold! In the name of the jurisdiction. Hold! In the name of the holy brotherhood. The first that he came upon was the pummeled Don Quixote, who lay stretched senseless on his back upon his broken-down bed, and, his hand falling on the beard as he felt about, he continued to cry, help for the jurisdiction. But perceiving that he whom he had laid hold of did not move or stir, he concluded that he was dead and that those in the room were his murderers, and with this suspicion he raised his voice still higher, calling out, shut the in-gate, see that no one goes out, they have killed a man here. This cry startled them all, and each dropped the contest at the point at which the voice reached him. The innkeeper retreated to his room, the carrier to his pack saddles, the last to her crib, the unlucky Don Quixote and Sancho alone were unable to move from where they were. The quadrilero on this let go Don Quixote's beard, and went out to look for a light to search for and apprehend the culprits, but not finding one, as the innkeeper had purposely extinguished the lantern on retreating to his room, he was compelled to have recourse to the hearth, where after much time and trouble he lit another lamp. Chapter 17 In which are contained the innumerable troubles which the brave Don Quixote and his good squire Sancho Panza endured in the INN, which to his misfortune he took to be a castle. By this time Don Quixote had recovered from his swoon, and in the same tone of voice in which he had called to his squire the day before when he lay stretched in the vale of the stakes, he began calling to him now, Sancho, my friend, art thou asleep? Sleepest thou, friend Sancho? How can I sleep, curses on it? Returned Sancho discontentedly and bitterly, when it is plain that all the devils have been at me this night. Thou mayest well believe that, answered Don Quixote, because, either I know little, or this castle is enchanted, for thou must know, but this that I am now about to tell thee thou must swear to keep secret until after my death. I swear it, answered Sancho. I say so, continued Don Quixote, because I hate taking away anyone's good name. I say, replied Sancho, that I swear to hold my tongue about it till the end of your worship's days, and God grant I may be able to let it out tomorrow. Do I do thee such injuries, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that thou wouldst see me dead so soon? It is not for that, replied Sancho, but because I hate keeping things long, and I don't want them to grow rotten with me from overkeeping. At any rate, said Don Quixote, I have more confidence in thy affection and good nature, and so I would have thee know that this night there befell me one of the strangest adventures that I could describe, and to relate it to thee briefly thou must know that a little while ago the daughter of the lord of this castle came to me, and that she is the most elegant and beautiful damsel that could be found in the wide world. What I could tell thee of the charms of her person. Of her lively wit of other secret matters which, to preserve the fealty I owe to my lady Dulcinea del Toboso, I shall pass over unnoticed and in silence. I will only tell thee that, either fate being envious of so great a boon placed in my hands by good fortune, or perhaps, and this is more probable, this castle being, as I have already said, enchanted, at the time when I was engaged in the sweetest and most amorous discourse with her, there came, without my seeing or knowing whence it came, a hand attached to some arm of some huge giant, that planted such a cuff on my jaws that I have them all bathed in blood, and then pummeled me in such a way that I am in a worse plight than yesterday when the carriers, on account of Rocinante's misbehavior, inflicted on us the injury thou knowest of, whence conjecture that there must be some enchanted more guarding the treasure of this damsel's beauty, and that it is not for me. Not for me either, said Sancho, for more than four hundred moors have so thrashed me that the drubbing of the stakes was cakes and fancy bread to it. But tell me, senor, 
What do you call this excellent and rare adventure that has left us as we are left now? Though your worship was not so badly off, having in your arms that incomparable beauty you spoke of, but I, what did I have, except the heaviest wax I think I had in all my life? Unlucky me and the mother that bore me. For I am not a knight errant and never expect to be one, and of all the mishaps, the greater part falls to my share. Then thou hast been thrashed too? said Don Quixote. Didn't I say so? Worse luck to my line, said Sancho. Be not distressed, friend, said Don Quixote, for I will now make the precious balsam with which we shall cure ourselves in the twinkling of an eye. By this time the quadrilero had succeeded in lighting the lamp, and came in to see the man that he thought had been killed, and as Sancho caught sight of him at the door, seeing him coming in his shirt, with a cloth on his head, and a lamp in his hand, and a very forbidding countenance, he said to his master, Senor, can it be that this is the enchanted Moor coming back to give us more castigation if there be anything still left in the ink bottle? It cannot be the Moor, answered Don Quixote, for those under enchantment do not let themselves be seen by anyone. If they don't let themselves be seen, they let themselves be felt, said Sancho, if not, let my shoulders speak to the point. Mine could speak too, said Don Quixote, but that is not a sufficient reason for believing that what we see is the enchanted Moor. The officer came up, and finding them engaged in such a peaceful conversation, stood amazed, though Don Quixote, to be sure, still lay on his back unable to move from pure pummeling and plasters. The officer turned to him and said, Well, how goes it, good man? I would speak more politely if I were you, replied Don Quixote, is it the way of this country to address knights errant in that style, you booby? The quadrilero finding himself so disrespectfully treated by such a sorry-looking individual, lost his temper, and raising the lamp full of oil, smote Don Quixote such a blow with it on the head that he gave him a badly broken pate, then, all being in darkness, he went out and Sancho Panza said, that is certainly the enchanted Moor, Senor, and he keeps the treasure for others, and for us only the cuffs and lamp wax. That is the truth, answered Don Quixote, and there is no use in troubling oneself about these matters of enchantment or being angry or vexed at them, for as they are invisible and visionary we shall find no one on whom to avenge ourselves, do what we may, rise, Sancho, if thou canst, and call the Alcaide of this fortress, and get him to give me a little oil, wine, salt, and rosemary to make the salutiferous balsam, for indeed I believe I have great need of it now, because I am losing much blood from the wound the phantom gave me. Sancho got up with pain enough in his bones, and went after the innkeeper in the dark, and meeting the officer, who was looking to see what had become of his enemy, he said to him, Senor, whoever you are, do us the favor and kindness to give us a little rosemary, oil, salt, and wine, for it is wanted to cure one of the best knights errant on earth, who lies on yonder bed wounded by the hands of the enchanted moor that is in this inn. When the officer heard him talk in this way, he took him for a man out of his senses, and as day was now beginning to break, he opened the inn gate, and calling the host, he told him what this good man wanted. The host furnished him with what he required, and Sancho brought it to Don Quixote, who, with his hand to his head, was bewailing the pain of the blow of the lamp, which had done him no more harm than raising a couple of rather large lumps, and what he fancied blood was only the sweat that flowed from him in his sufferings during the late storm. To be brief, he took the materials, of which he made a compound, mixing them all and boiling them a good while until it seemed to him they had come to perfection. He then asked for some vial to pour it into, and as there was not one in the inn, he decided on putting it into a tin oil bottle or flask of which the host made him a free gift and over the flask he repeated more than eighty paternosters and as many more Ave Marias, salves, and credos, accompanying each word with a cross by way of benediction, at all which there were present Sancho, the innkeeper, and the quadrilero, for the carrier was now peacefully engaged in attending to the comfort of his mules. This being accomplished, he felt anxious to make trial himself, on the spot, of the virtue of this precious balsam, as he considered it, and so he drank near a quart of what could not be put into the flask and remained in the pigskin in which it had been boiled, but scarcely had he done drinking when he began to vomit in such a way that nothing was left in his stomach, and with the pangs and spasms of vomiting he broke into a profuse sweat, on account of which he bade them cover him up and leave him alone. They did so, and he lay sleeping more than three hours, at the end of which he awoke and felt very great bodily relief and so much ease from his bruises that he thought himself quite cured, and verily believed he had hit upon the balsam of Firabras, and that with this remedy he might thenceforward, without any fear, face any kind of destruction, battle, or combat, however perilous it might be. Sancho Panza, who also regarded the amendment of his master as miraculous, begged him to give him what was left in the pigskin, which was no small quantity. Don Quixote consented, 
and he, taking it with both hands, in good faith and with a better will, gulped down and drained off very little less than his master. But the fact is, that the stomach of poor Sancho was of necessity not so delicate as that of his master, and so, before vomiting, he was seized with such gripings and retchings, and such sweats and faintness, that verily and truly he believed his last hour had come, and finding himself so racked and tormented he cursed the balsam and the thief that had given it to him. Don Quixote seeing him in this state said, it is my belief, Sancho, that this mischief comes of thy not being dubbed a knight, for I am persuaded this liquor cannot be good for those who are not so. If your worship knew that, returned Sancho, woe betide me and all my kindred. Why did you let me taste it? At this moment the draught took effect, and the poor squire began to discharge both ways at such a rate that the rush mat on which he had thrown himself and the canvas blanket he had covering him were fit for nothing afterwards. He sweated and perspired with such paroxysms and convulsions that not only he himself but all present thought his end had come. This tempest and tribulation lasted about two hours, at the end of which he was left, not like his master, but so weak and exhausted that he could not stand. Don Quixote, however, who, as has been said, felt himself relieved and well, was eager to take his departure at once in quest of adventures, as it seemed to him that all the time he loitered there was a fraud upon the world and those in it who stood in need of his help and protection all the more when he had the security and confidence his balsam afforded him, and so, urged by this impulse, he saddled Rocinante himself and put the pack saddle on his squire's beast, whom likewise he helped to dress and mount the ass, after which he mounted his horse and turning to a corner of the inn he laid hold of a pike that stood there, to serve him by way of a lance. All that were in the inn, who were more than twenty persons, stood watching him, the innkeeper's daughter was likewise observing him, and he too never took his eyes off her, and from time to time fetched a sigh that he seemed to pluck up from the depths of his bowels, but they all thought it must be from the pain he felt in his ribs, at any rate they who had seen him plaster the night before thought so. As soon as they were both mounted, at the gate of the inn, he called to the host and said in a very grave and measured voice, Many and great are the favours, Señor Alcaide, that I have received in this castle of yours, and I remain under the deepest obligation to be grateful to you for them all the days of my life, if I can repay them in avenging you of any arrogant foe who may have wronged you know that my calling is no other than to aid the weak, to avenge those who suffer wrong, and to chastise perfidy. Search your memory, and if you find anything of this kind you need only tell me of it, and I promise you by the order of knighthood which I have received to procure you satisfaction and reparation to the utmost of your desire. The innkeeper replied to him with equal calmness, Sir Knight, I do not want your worship to avenge me of any wrong, because when any is done me I can take what vengeance seems good to me, the only thing I want is that you pay me the score that you have run up in the inn last night, as well for the straw and barley for your two beasts, as for supper and beds. Then this is an inn? said Don Quixote. And a very respectable one, said the innkeeper. I have been under a mistake all this time, answered Don Quixote, for in truth I thought it was a castle, and not a bad one, but since it appears that it is not a castle but an inn, all that can be done now is that you should excuse the payment, for I cannot contravene the rule of knights errant, of whom I know as a fact, and up to the present I have read nothing to the contrary that they never paid for lodging or anything else in the inn where they might be, for any hospitality that might be offered them is their due by law and right in return for the insufferable toil they endure in seeking adventures by night and by day, in summer and in winter, on foot and on horseback, in hunger and thirst, cold and heat, exposed to all the inclemencies of heaven and all the hardships of earth. I have little to do with that, replied the innkeeper, pay me what you owe me, and let us have no more talk of chivalry, for all I care about is to get my money. You are a stupid, scurvy innkeeper, said Don Quixote, and putting spurs to Rocinante and bringing his pike to the slope he rode out of the inn before anyone could stop him, and pushed on some distance without looking to see if his squire was following him. The innkeeper when he saw him go without paying him ran to get payment of Sancho, who said that as his master would not pay neither would he, because, being as he was squire to a knight errant, the same rule and reason held good for him as for his master with regard to not paying anything in inns and hostelries. At this the innkeeper waxed very wroth, and threatened if he did not pay to compel him in a way that he would not like. To which Sancho made answer that by the law of chivalry his master had received he would not pay a rap, though it cost him his life, for the excellent and ancient usage of knights errant was not going to be violated by him, nor should the squires of such as were yet to come into the world ever complain of him or reproach him with breaking so just a privilege. The ill luck of the unfortunate Sancho so ordered it that among the company in the inn there were four wool carters from Segovia, three needle-makers from the cold of Cordova, and two lodgers from the fair of Seville, lively fellows, tender-hearted, fond of a joke, and playful, who, almost as if instigated and moved by a common impulse, 
made up to Sancho and dismounted him from his ass, while one of them went in for the blanket of the host's bed, but on flinging him into it they looked up, and seeing that the ceiling was somewhat lower than what they required for their work, they decided upon going out into the yard, which was bounded by the sky, and there, putting Sancho in the middle of the blanket, they began to raise him high, making sport with him as they would with a dog at Shrovetide. The cries of the poor blanketed wretch were so loud that they reached the ears of his master, who, halting to listen attentively, was persuaded that some new adventure was coming, until he clearly perceived that it was his squire who uttered them. Wheeling about he came up to the inn with a laborious gallop, and finding it shut went round it to see if he could find some way of getting in, but as soon as he came to the wall of the yard, which was not very high, he discovered the game that was being played with his squire. He saw him rising and falling in the air with such grace and nimbleness that, had his rage allowed him, it is my belief he would have laughed. He tried to climb from his horse on to the top of the wall, but he was so bruised and battered that he could not even dismount, and so from the back of his horse he began to utter such maledictions and objurgations against those who were blanketing Sancho as it would be impossible to write down accurately. They, however, did not stay their laughter or their work for this, nor did the flying Sancho cease his lamentations, mingled now with threats, now with entreaties but all to little purpose, or none at all, until from pure weariness they left off. They then brought him his ass, and mounting him on top of it they put his jacket round him, and the compassionate Maritornas, seeing him so exhausted, thought fit to refresh him with a jug of water, and that it might be all the cooler she fetched it from the well. Sancho took it, and as he was raising it to his mouth he was stopped by the cries of his master exclaiming, Sancho, my son, drink not water, drink it not, my son, for it will kill thee, see, here I have the blessed balsam, and he held up the flask of liquor, and with drinking two drops of it thou wilt certainly be restored. At these words Sancho turned his eyes asquent, and in a still louder voice said, Can it be your worship has forgotten that I am not a knight, or do you want me to end by vomiting up what bowels I have left after last night? Keep your liquor in the name of all the devils, and leave me to myself. And at one and the same instant he left off talking and began drinking, but as at the first sup he perceived it was water he did not care to go on with it, and begged Maritornas to fetch him some wine, which she did with right good will, and paid for it with her own money, for indeed they say of her that, though she was in that line of life, there was some faint and distant resemblance to a Christian about her. When Sancho had done drinking he dug his heels into his ass, and the gate of the inn being thrown open he passed out very well pleased at having paid nothing and carried his point, though it had been at the expense of his usual sureties, his shoulders. It is true that the innkeeper detained his alforges in payment of what was owing to him, but Sancho took his departure in such a flurry that he never missed them. The innkeeper, as soon as he saw him off, wanted to bar the gate close, but the blanketers would not agree to it, for they were fellows who would not have cared two farthings for Don Quixote, even had he been really one of the knights errant of the round table. また、テキスト、MP3 ダウンロードも合わせてご利用ください 88thpp.com 88thpp.com